So this is how I structure this, this talk a little bit. So I will, I will walk you through what's going on in terms from research to action in, in, for global discrepancies in cancer control. I'm talking about the global landscape and discrepancies in cancer burden, discrepancies in cancer surveillance, discrepancies in cancer control, in particular in primary prevention, and, but as well as in secondary prevention. So let's start with the local, uh, the global landscape and the discrepancies in cancer burden. And these are many. So these are, in 2018, the men and women uh, developing cancer, incident cases. And for 2018, we have quite staggering numbers. They are, they are very large indeed. And it's about one in each five men worldwide will develop cancer uh, during their lifetime. And one in each six women during their lifetime. And basically, none of our countries, not even the richest countries in Europe, are entirely prepared uh, to take care of these cases. There is a lot still of waiting uh, and, and lack of care, lack of early diagnosis. So it's, it's, it's quite a huge burden to the, to the people, to the family, but also to societies and to the healthcare system. And this burden is, it will increase in during the next decades, that's, that's pretty much sure. How about mortality? So this is what we see. One in every eight men in 2018 died of cancer. And in one in 11, 18 women died of the disease globally. This is again very uh, high. And we are expecting in the next 20 years that cancer will be the number one cause of death throughout the world, in all countries globally. So uh, we are not to go, to go out of job, sort of to say, at least not in the, in the next decades to come. So this is the total number of, of cancer cases globally and how they are distributed ac across continents. So in total, 18.1 million new cancer cases, and most of them occur in Asia, which is the purple part of this graph. So 48% of all new cancer cases, almost 9 million cancer cases occurring in Asia. This is basically because, of course, the very uh, large concentration of population in this area. They are about 60% of the global population. Europe corresponds to a smaller part of the global population, about 11%, but in Europe, 23% of all cancer cases occur. So cancer incidence in Europe is still very high because, of course, the population is old is, and is aging more and more, and incidence rates are very high. The Americas, uh, including Canada and, and US, USA, correspond to about 14% of the global population and 21% of the global bird of incident cases, about 4 million per year. Africa, 5.8% uh, 8, 8 uh, of all cancer cases, about 1 million, but increasing very rapidly. And Oceania, the, the part of the world with least cancer cases, 250,000, estimating to our, in, in 2018. So the incidence, but also the patterns of cancer are changing globally. Because the poor countries, the countries with least resources that had before a pattern which was totally uh, linked to infections, infections-related cancer, are switching now to a more westernized pattern of cancer, including mostly breast and prostate cancer, as we are going to see in the next slides. So how are the mortality rates? they are a little bit different. So it's about half. So about all we people in the world getting cancer, about half will die of it. Of course, there's a very large variation between cancer sites, but if you need to remember roughly the numbers, is, is twice as many get, get cancer as they die for it. And here, again, we have a very important uh, concentration in Asia. 60% of all cancer deaths occur in Asia, and they are corresponding to about 6 million. 
This is very high comparing to incidence because there are many cancer types occurring, particularly in Asia, which are very fatal. For example, stomach cancer and liver cancer are relatively more common in Asia than in Europe and in the US, and they are very highly fatal. In, the, in Europe, the proportion of deaths is a little bit lower than the proportion of incidence because the early treatment, early diagnosis, and also the, the occurrence of cancers which are less fatal, as well as in the Americas, where, where the, uh, fatality, the, the proportion of deaths is 14%. So about 2 million deaths in Europe, 1.3 million deaths in, in the Americas, 700,000 deaths in Africa corresponding to 7.3, which is high in, in correlation, in, if you correct, uh, correlate it to incidence, because of usually very late diagnosis and very poor confirmation of diagnosis and treatment. So quite of a crisis, I would say, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa. And in Oceania, the problem is still relatively small because the population is small. But overall, a very important public health problem globally, increasingly so, and, and a big challenge for, to, to healthcare systems and, and to healthcare professionals, of course, including all of us. So which are the biggest challenges and, and how should we concentrate our efforts if we want to change the curves for incidence and mortality globally? So here I'm using data from a, from a website which is called Cancer Today, which is what we call the Global Cancer Observatory, which is a part of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, website. It's a freely assessed website that you can go and make your own graphs and your own figures for the whole world or for your region and so on and so forth. And it's also a very go good tool for teaching. So if you are teaching in your faculties of medicine or public health, I think this is a very good instrument to, for, for teaching purposes. So let's have a look of the percentage of new cases, uh, that means incident cases and cancer deaths globally in 2018. For instance, number one is still lung cancer. So we have known the main cancer or the main cause of lung cancer for six decades at least. Many of us here have made groundbreaking uh, description of this epidemic early on. I know Professor Zaritzi has been working with our colleagues in Oxford and, and were describing also this epidemic decades ago and still number one killer worldwide for incidence and for mortality. So for instance, we have uh, it's 11% of all, 11.6% of all cancers are lung cases, but look at mortality, 18.4. So mortality, uh, pro the proportion of cancers uh, dead due, due to lung cancer are higher than the mortality because the fatality is, is extremely high. So uh, about 2 million new cases uh, and 1.8 million dead. So survival is very poor. The second most common incident uh, cancer globally is breast cancer, corresponding to 12% of all new cancer cases, about 2 million new cancer cases per year. Third one, colorectal cancer, 10%. 10 followed by prostate cancer and stomach cancer. I think in particular for you, this audience who is very interested in prevention, I think the good news is that we know pretty much what to do for lung, for breast and for colorectal cancer. So a very large proportion of these cancers can be either prevented or detected early and therefore treated uh, effectively. So there's a very large uh, possibility for, for changing the incidence curve by acting in these top priority cancers. For stomach cancer, my colleague Rolando Herrero will talk after me a little bit about the new ideas and, and new challenges in this cancer. It's still an important cancer globally, with one million people uh, getting it, uh, so it and about 783,000 dying for it, so very high uh, fatality rate as well, and action needs to be done as we do for cervical cancer, also for stomach cancer, in terms to, to, to tackle this problem. If you look at the mortality uh, 
types of cancers which are most frequent, besides lung, colorectal, uh, breast, and stomach, we also find liver cancer. Liver is not among the most incidence cancer types, but it's among the uh, most fatal cancer types. So 8% of all cancer deaths are attributable to, to liver cancer. So again, if we, we look here, lung cancer, we know how to prevent the vast majority of this uh, 1.8 million deaths. Colorectal cancer, there is a screening which is highly effective. Stomach cancer, Rolando will discuss with us, but there are means of decreasing its incidence and mortality. Liver cancer, we know an, a vaccine. For decades we have known a vaccine which is quite effective. And we also know now there are treatments for people with, which are chronic carriers of certain types of hepatitis B, so part of these deaths can certainly be prevented. And breast cancer, which is highly amenable for early detection and early treatment. So again, a very great opportunity for public health here to change the both incidence and mortality cur curves globally. So cancer is a disease of inequality. And in this graph, it's, it's a very complicated graph because it combines a map of the world with different colors for different countries, but also division by human development index. Human development, development index is a summary index of richness versus poverty, let's say like this. It includes measures like the gross national product and the ownership of goods and access to service, uh, length of life and so on. So it summarizes all the measures of richness of a country. And we have here divided uh, in four categories. Very high uh, human development index countries. And these include basically the dark blue countries like Canada, USA, Argentina, Chile. Look at here, parts of the, the, Russian, the Russian Federation, but also Australia and Western Europe. And then we have the high development index, which includes a very large part of the world, mostly the population included in China and in Central Asia, but also Latin America and Northern Africa. The medium high development index, which is the dark red in, in Central uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the low development index, with, which includes the parts of the map in, in orange. So then we, we described here the five top cancer types in high development areas, and these are breast, females only, colorectal, about for both females and male, lung, both genders, prostate and bladder. So these are the most common types for very high human development in the index. For high, we see a change. We see that lung is the most common followed by colorectal, breast, stomach, and liver. So you see liver appearing here and stomach, which were not present in the other ones. For medium uh, human development index, you see breast. So breast is the most common ab ab about everywhere, followed by lung, cancer, colorectal, and liver, and lip and oral cavity. And for low human development index, you see breast, cervix, prostate, colon, and liver. The size of the bar represents the total number of cases. Uh, and this represents that in very high, high uh, is, is where most of the cancer cases are concentrated, where in medium and low, a lower overall number of cases are presented. But the challenges are everywhere. And given the growth of the population, in particular in medium high uh, development index and low human development index region, these numbers will get, grow very much in the next decades. Oops. So this is the corresponding uh, map for mortality. And here it, it's a map, in fact, for females only. And it, it, for each country and the color corresponds, which are the cancer type uh, number one responsible for mor mortality globally. And the pink color represents breast cancer. And it's, it's quite staggering, right? Almost all over the world, breast cancer is currently number one responsible for, oh no, apologies, for incidence globally. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very important uh, cancer now. Uh, the orange color is cervical cancer, and here you can see where the pockets of incidence are, and they are mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, in, but also in parts of uh, 
border with North Africa in South America. And in Mongolia, we have a pocket of liver cancer. So it's, it's in a way, something exceptional in, uh, in the world, that liver cancer is number one among females in this region. So breast cancer and cervical cancer, followed by liver cancer, very important uh, for prevention uh, in different parts of the world. So when we look a little bit more in detail for females, for cancer incidence, breast, 24%, colorectal, 9%, lung, 8.4%, cervical, 66 thyroid, 5.1. For thyroid, we still think that some of this uh, in incredibly high uh, incidence might be due to overdiagnosis. We, we have observed this and documented this in a few countries. For mortality, we still see breast as number one, 15% of all female mortality, followed by lung, which is much higher than the incidence, proportional incidence, colorectal and cervix. And of course, for a few countries in the world, it will be different distribution according to inequality index. So, for deaths by country, we see a slightly inversion here, as I mentioned, according to the level of richness of the country. The blue color is lung. So in the Americas, in North America and Canada, still lung cancer is number one for mortality. And also in Europe, in China, and in Australia. Purple is breast. So breast cancer responsible for mortality in a very vast majority in the world. And orange color is cervix mortality. Quite staggering. So number one mortality in sub-Saharan Africa is still cervical cancer. And again, as we discussed this morning, a vast majority of these cancers are entirely preventable. So the most common cancer deaths uh, by country by, uh, for females in 2018, and this is according to the Human Development Index that I described earlier. So the white color is the year of life uh, lost with, lived with disability, and the pink is the years of li life lost or by death. So, and you can see that the, the very high have, even though they have more cancers, they have a lower uh, proportion of DALIS, the, the years of life with disability. And the low income countries or the, the low development industry, they have a much higher. So the proportion of the burden of cancer, the, the burden of cancer in lower countries in a way is very much different for cervical cancer. And for breast cancer, it's a little bit more even across the human development index. So the disparity or the burden in low income countries for cervical cancer is in a way much more important for cervical cancer than it is for breast cancer. So let's have a, a quick look uh, in most common cancer in incidence by men in 2018. The green color is prostate cancer. So it's still the most common cancer type in the Americas, most of Africa, Australia, and Europe. While lung cancer is still the very much more common in Russia, China, and many parts of uh, North Africa, and, and Central and Eastern Europe. When we look in more detail by the most common cancer types by males in 2018, we see that lung cancer is responsible for 14% of all incidents, but 22% of all mortality. The second one is prostate cancer, which is 13% of the uh, incidents, but is only 6.7% of the mortality, followed by colorectal cancer, 11% of incidence and 9% of the mortality. Liver cancer, 6% of the incidence and 10% of the mortality. And stomach cancer, 7% of the incidence, oops, and 9% of the mortality. This is the map by uh, 
dead mortality for men by type of cancer, lung cancer across the world, extremely important, except for a few countries, which is the green color, which is prostate cancer, which is the most important cause of mortality. Uh, the orange color is liver cancer, and the dark blue color is lip and oral cavity cancer, which is very important, in, uh, in particularly in the Indian subcontinent. So what's going to happen from now, 2018 and 2014, given the demographic changes, the fact that we, we grow the number of people globally and people grow older and live more? a very large increase. So we are going to see a very large increase in the overall number of people getting cancer just because we have more people globally and people are getting older. And the numbers will increase differently according to human development index. So in low human development index, it will be an increase of about from 0 0.7 to 1.4 million, and from a medium development index from 2.8 to 4.9, from high human development index from 6.5 to 10.5, from very high from 8.1 to 10.7. So again, a very high increase, and that will uh, make an enormous burden in the healthcare system. So research from action. So which are now the disparities according? We, we, we saw before then that it's very important disparities according to incidence and to mortality, according to gender uh, across continents and countries. But how this reflects in terms of cancer surveillance? And to express this, I tried to put together, or I copied this graph from my colleague Marion Pinheiros, that, who published this in 2017. And she described the whole uh, spectrum of cancer control measures from prevention, early detection, treatment, and survivorship, and end-of-life care. And the population, of course, benefits this in different uh, parts of, of their, their trajectory, from health status, from newly diagnosis, living with cancer, and dying of cancer. And also she described the basic surveillance measure, measures in practice, from risk factors, which are only measured and controlling a few countries in the world, such as the Nordic countries, but not all over. Uh, to population surveys, which are done in some countries, but again, not systematically, in particular to measure risk factors. And then the measures which most countries are somehow collecting, such as incidence and survival by cancer type and by stages, if mostly and hopefully by population-based cancer registers, about, although not all countries have such registers. Many countries have only uh, other types of hospital-based registers, which are not ideal. And of course, mortality uh, surveillance, which in principle shall be available for all countries around the world, although in fact it's not. In many countries, they are only estimates. We don't really know the exact number of people dying and the causes of that. So most countries have also some sort of vital statistics. So the, basically, the number of people alive or dead at a certain timing point. But again, for most parts of the globe, these are estimates. They are not real numbers. So this is the model that allows us to, out, to do measurements of attributable risk of cancer, prevalence, disability-adjusted life years, but also research regarding associated economic risk factors. We had this morning two outstanding presentations on the economical burden of cancer by two students, PhD students from Tampere University, and they really show how important this is. Without the, the economic argument, it will be very difficult to convince policymakers to take cancer prevention uh, seriously. So surveillance data is very important, but how equal is this capture globally? Actually, not, not very equally. This graph simply lists all countries in the world and according to the number of registries they have in cancer incidence in five continents, which is the, the gold standard for uh, global cancer statistics that we concentrate at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And we see that there are countries in this part of the, the graph which have more uh, 
concentration of registries, 10 others. So which are these countries? Actually, these, these are the countries which the, the high quality cancer registries and the, the one in blue color and the ones with yellow color and uh, orange color are the ones with not so good quality registry and the gray ones with no information. So how is this distributed according to uh, poverty index. Actually, most of the countries with high quality cancer registration are the rich countries. So there is very limited uh, expertise and resources in countries of middle income and low income for cancer registration. And this is mainly because there is competing, uh, competing uh, priorities for, for health care and, and for health surveillance and limited awareness of the importance of the cancer registry and the lack of knowledge of how to use the information for economical impact. So how are the discrepancies in cancer control in terms of primary prevention globally? I will just give an example that I assume most of you are aware of about smoking. So what we can see in, in this graph is the changes in smoking prevalence in the US blacks, in pink, in the Netherlands, in orange, in the US whites, in blue, United Kingdom, and so on, over time, over the decades. And we can see a decrease there mainly in men, while in women, which are the dotted lines, we can basically see an increase over the decades in all the same countries. So it's quite staggering. It's a very different sort of stage of the epidemics of smoking in men and women. And of course, this re reflects dramatically in the curves of incidence and mortality for uh, lung cancer. And this is, is what, exactly what we see in cancer registers globally, in particularly well documented in countries that have population-based cancer registry. But we also see that quite clearly in mortality registries. So this is the UK Mayo prediction. So in terms of decreasing in smoking prevalence over the decades, and at the same time, it's an increase in the total number of lung cancer cases, which might seem contra contradictory, but in fact it is not, because we note that there is a, a time lag between measures adopted to, uh, to make people stop smoking and the incidence of lung cancer. This graph is a little bit difficult to see from the distance, but the purple bullets here represent the measures taken in the UK in, in, from the 60, 65, 71, 80, and so on, to make people stop smoking, like making announcements, increasing price, increasing legislation to, to avoid smoking in public places. So this is how it affects, in a way, the, uh, the, the prevalence of smoking. So it was very high in the, in the 50s and 60s, and then it gradually decreases until now. But look at the, the incidence curve of, for lung cancer. It was still increasing even when the measures of smoking cessation were implemented and only, only now we are seeing a decrease. The green line is Poland. Actually, the same measures were, uh, were adopted, but with a, a, a lagging time of 30 years in regarding to the UK. And we see exactly the same curve occurring in Poland, a little bit higher indices as the UK, but we see uh, 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 the same pattern. So they are totally parallel, these two curves. And also we see a very similar curve than in the UK, but again with the lag of 30 years. So this decrease we have not yet seen in other countries, and uh, I mean our, our colleagues in China are yet to see sort of all the, all the, the impact. So we are still going to see uh, the continuation of the uh, lung cancer epidemic, despite the changes that, that are being implemented now. So, uh, primary prevention is still. So the global commitment for, for uh, control of tobacco has been implemented in 180 countries globally. However, there are a few countries in this map listed in red that have not yet fully comply to it. And it's quite staggering. So I think you would be surprised to see some very developed countries that have not really uh, done their homework uh, despite the 60 years evidence uh, available to us.
there is some progress globally, so, uh, but the progress is slow. And in fact, the progress is too slow to see lung cancer disappearing as a, as a public health program in your lifetime. So with some luck, our great-grandchildren will see an elimination of, of the tobacco epidemic, but we will not. So we, 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 uh, because the progress of the implementation of, of the, the tobacco measures globally is very slow, and the progress is very slow. So from 2012, from 2014, only, uh, only a few more additional countries have uh, adopted the measures. And also, this is, this is an example of the smoking-free legislation that continues to be the most widely adopted measure globally, with 1.3 billion people living in 49 countries, or only 18% of the global population covered. It's not a very large proportion. But it's increasing, and, and increasing every year. So it's still much more advocacy needs to be done. This is just a little bit more, more evidence on the, on the slow progress on the implementation of tobacco-free initiatives globally. So again, the, the full implementation of tobacco initiatives are yet to be implemented uh, globally. So changing gears from tobacco, which is something that I, most of us are, are quite aware of, to BMI, body mass index, which is a measure of fatness, how much fat a, pers a person has uh, in the body. It's not a perfect measure, but it's a relatively good measure that has been shown to correlate with mortality quite well. And the importance of, of body mass index in, for carcinogenesis is becoming more and more evident, in particular because uh, the importance of tobacco is somehow decreasing. And here I listed uh, an article from my colleague Melinda Arnold that was published in Lancet Oncology in 2015 showing the population attributable fraction, that means which is the proportion of all cancer cases that are attributable uh, to, to being too fat. And what she shows that in the US, uh, and the green color are women and the uh, red color are men. In the US, 9.5% of all cancer cases in uh, women are attributed to BMI, too much BMI, and in men, 3.5. In Saudi Arabia, 9.2 and 4.0. And the, these numbers that we are seeing in Saudi Arabia, actually they are replicable for the whole Middle East. The Middle East has a very important problem of obesity, which, obesity, which is reflected not only here with uh, cancer, but also with all other obesity-related diseases, in particular diabetes. But it, it's, a, it's a ticking bomb. It's, it's, it's quite impressive. But also in Argentina, which is, which is a, a, a country in South America, so 9% of all cases in women and 4.5% in men. UK, 8.2 and 0.54. China, 3% in men and 0.8% in women, but growing rapidly. So obesity, uh, the proportion of ob obese people, and in particular obese children in China, is increasing extremely rapidly. So these, these numbers will be, uh, we, will, we are going to be seeing much more obesity-related incidence cases in, uh, in China in the future. Also in Africa, 2% of all cancers in female and 0.4% in men, and in India, 1.2% in men and 0.2% uh, in, uh, in, uh, in males. So how this reflects in the, in the total number of cases, in the US is about 72,000 in women and 28,000 in men. And taking another country, because of the size of population, China, the obesity figures are responsible for 35,000 uh, cancers in, in females and 13,000 uh, in men. So we know exactly which are the causes. It's, it's simply consumption of food too high in calories and sugar and, and too little physical activity. Of course, there are other reasons for, for excess obesity, but these two reasons combined explain the vast bulk of, the, of why people are obese globally. 
So social equalities in cancer are also reflected in, in many other ways. And here I list, I, I just display the trends in all mortality rates according to education level. And each line corresponds to a, to a country. And what you can see basically is that despite the decrease in cancer mortality in, in, in all countries, People with low education, which are the, the panels on your left-hand side, in both men and women, this is men, this is women, the decrease in, in, is, is in mortality is much less fast, is much slower than in rich countries. So in poor countries, the decrease in, in, in mortality is much less uh, in, in among the poor than among the rich uh, at a global scale. So about the global HPV vaccination, which many of you are interested in here, so how fast are we progressing in vaccinating or, or, or girls? And actually not fast enough. And to, to tell a long story short, globally, the estimates by, one, by our colleague Laila Bruni uh, in uh, Barcelona, publishing the Lancet Global Health in 2016, indicate that the, the total vaccine updated globally is only 8.2%. This is very low. This is a, a vaccine that can save lives, and as we abundantly show this morning, is extremely efficacious and has basically no important side effects. And still, only 8.2% of the global target population was benefiting of, of this uh, in 2016. It's growing, but it's growing too slowly, and we really hope that, to, that this will increase dramatically. Remember that the WHO targets uh, are 90% of the girls. So we have still a very long way to go to reach these targets. So the estimated full course coverage of HBV vaccine by 2014 was also very much this disparous across the world, with girls in rich countries being the ones benefiting more. In North America, for instance, girls between 10 and 40 years, 28% were vaccinated, and 15 to 90 years, 41%. Why in parts in Western Africa, there was, we, we don't know because we don't have data, probably very little, almost nothing. In Eastern Africa, it's almost nothing. And in, in other parts, also very low. In Australia, very high. And we know that probably Australia and New Zealand will be the countries that will first reach the WHO targets and likely see cervical cancer eliminated. Uh, in a few years' time. In Europe, we are doing progress, and here we are in Northern Europe, particularly progress is being made. In Eastern Europe, there is a long way to go. And I think in particular in the Russian Federation, there are challenges, uh, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's something to be worked out in the, in the next years to come. So discrepancies in cancer control in terms of secondary prevention. And I will be quite brief here because it's basically the same story. So the rich countries have much higher access to health care. And, in, and, also, and therefore, all it reflects throughout the, the spectrum of, uh, of cancer-associated disparities. So the uh, regular access to health care is, is better, and, the, and therefore, the cancer-associated disparities are low. And in the poor countries, the other way around. So the richer you are off, as in everything else, the less morbidity and mortality, basically. So my colleague, Dr. Parta Basu, published a paper in the International Journal of Cancer in 2018 trying to map the progress of different countries in regarding to breast cancer, cervical cancer, and colorectal cancer screening. And, he, and this is included in a, in a publication that many of our colleagues present in this room uh, have worked together, I believe Mark Arbin, uh, Arti Antila, Roland Herrero, the, which is the cancer screening in the European Union in 2017. And which shows which countries that have made progress in breast cancer screening and particularly in cervical cancer screening, the blue color meaning that these countries have ruled out 
the, the programs uh, completely, but the countries in red had not yet really reached their targets. However, the progress in colorectal cancer is much smaller, and the pink color represents the country where the rollout is not really complete yet. So, and it's basically most of Europe. And in, in, uh, in red, the countries where there is simply no population-based programs. So much more progress to be done in colorectal cancer screening. So this is the map for breast cancer screening, the existence of some type of, uh, of breast cancer screening across the world. And the countries in green where there is some, something going on, the countries in blue where not much really is happening, and in, in re red as we are going to see uh, in the next map is that where we have no data. For cervical cancer coverage, the, the map is, is particularly dramatic, I think, for sub-Saharan Africa, again, which is the region where we have seen before has the highest uh, numbers of deaths. And yet, there is very little, if any, uh, population-based screening going on. There are some pockets doing, doing uh, hospital-based or uh, ad hoc screening, but with, with very little, if any, population impact. So opportunistic versus organized uh, population screening, as Dr. Artiantla explained to us today, really uh, organized screening uh, is the way to go. Opportunistic screening does not have an impact uh, on the long, on, it's not cost effective. But we see that uh, still many countries are, which are listed in blue are only doing opportunistic screening, including in North America and in South America. I list here Brazil, which is one of the countries in South America investing a huge amount of uh, money and resources in, in population screening, but still yet not reaching uh, a level which is, uh, that would justify the, the investments they are doing. I don't expect you to see this graph, uh, but it just represents the projected cervi cervical cancer incidence rates according to human development index, low, medium, high, and very high, with different measures, and the amount of effort that countries might put in terms of the vaccination and screening combined. And again, to tell a very long story short, we see that the low uh, high development in the human development index countries are the countries that will benefit most for intense screening and intense vaccination for HPV in the decades to come. It's also important, of course, to do all around the world, but the rich countries will benefit relatively less as compared to low uh, high development index countries. So efforts needs to be done everywhere, but in particularly in low human development index countries. Colorectal cancer, this is really where I think the public health community uh, working on cancer need to concentrate also far more efforts because colorectal cancer is a very important uh, cause of incidence and mortality globally, both for men and women. And, he, and we know that uh, screening works and decreases incidence and mortality. This has been well documented now. And there is an IARC publication in our IARC website summarizing all the evidence in a lot of detail, if any of you is interested. So how is the status? We see that very few uh, countries outside Europe, in fact, are doing anything. Here I just saw an example of East and Southeast Asia, where you have some organized pilot uh, work ongoing in China among people 40 to 74 year, years and in Hong Kong. Also in the Republic of Korea that has done some effort in Singapore and Thailand. But in all other countries is only opportunistic uh, work which does not have really any impact on incidents. So if we look in Latin America, based only Argentina, Brazil, and Chile are doing pilot organized screening programs. All other programs are opportunistic and again have basically very little, if any, impact. So a, a huge missed opportunity. The, the screening for colorectal cancer now, the FIT test, the fecal uh, blood that you can search in, in stool and can be done by the patient at home, 
is very cheap, it's only a few cents of dollar, so it's accessible. So it's really up to the countries now to take up the challenge and, and implement this in a more systematic way. So in some regions of the world for colorectal cancer screening, there is pretty much nothing going on. We have almost zero. Yeah, we have basically no information whatsoever in, in Africa, very, very little. And also in Central, in Central Asia, there is, there is not, basically nothing going on. So in conclusion, uh, some populations experience inequalities, not only in terms of risk factor, but also in terms of screening, early detection, and treatment. And this is, this is something that we really need to work over. Overall cancer rates are increasing, and they are disparous according to the Human Development Index globally. We do need to implement what we, are, we already know in terms of cancer prevention, cancer screening, and cancer early diagnosis and treatment. And only doing that, we will dramatically change the curves for incidence and mortality uh, globally. I think we have also a, 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 an obligation to decrease inequalities within countries, but between countries in terms of knowledge, early diagnosis, treatment, uh, and access to care. And we need to improve screening techniques and programs and make them accessible to all countries, including the poorest countries. And we need to apply an appropriate balance of investment in health services and public health actions. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. It was very inspiring talk and a good uh, summary of the global situation. It's a pity we will not have time for discussion for the, uh, before the next session. So that, uh, but I think that we have to think also in the future about the systematic aspects in cancer control. And you mentioned primary prevention, secondary prevention many times. It is also very relevant for other diseases than cancer alone, so that maybe also the strategies to combine these two things, two primary prevention also in connection of screening programs would be nice because then it could really affect also for the life expectancies and other factors that are very important thing also in terms of health inequities. Thank you very much and uh, let's go for the next session.